Grace, mercy, peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and, G and Savior Jesus, the one who draws us into community. Amen. Our focus for this morning is on John chapter 4. If you've got a Bible with you, or if you want to take one from the, from the pew rack, you can certainly follow along with me. John 4 has a few different stories, but it certainly has this very poignant conversation between a woman at the well and Jesus. And it shows us what it looks like to live in community that starts with acknowledgement of sin and repentance and how that shapes not just one person's life, but an entire community's life around her. Particularly verses 28 and 29, then the woman left her water jar, went into town and told the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? As we consider community around Christ. Would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts, be pleasing and acceptable to you our rock and our redeemer. Holy Spirit, be in my lips and in the ears and hearts of everyone present that we may all hear a good word from you. Amen. So we started last week on this conversation about being incarnate community with this conversation about the image of God, which is a, a gigantic theological idea. In, in, in fact, it's probably one of the most important in the whole Bible. We will, were created in the image of God to incarnate who God is. He places his image into us, much like you would see if you pressed a, uh, your hand into a mattress with one of those memory foam. God presses his image into us, and then he encourages us to do the same to others. And we get this at, in the creation story in Genesis 1, where so many things start. Then God said, let us make man in our image. Whether that's talking about the Trinity or the courts of heaven, this is a plural thing. It's a community thing. According to our likeness, made for communication and interaction, they will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. He created us to be able to communicate and have community, have re relationships with him first and then with one another. He wants us to be proper image bearers of who he is in the real world, incarnate image bearers, like Jesus was able to do perfectly. But we don't often do that. As we think about images in our, our world, it got me thinking about this computer term, the, the resolution of an image. Maybe you've heard that before. If, if you've got a really high resolution image, it's going to be crystal clear. But if it's a low resolution image, low res, it's going to be a little blurry. So what if you saw something like this? It's not a very good image, is it? It's kind of washed out. If you looked hard enough, you might be able to see something that you might recognize. But how about if we sharpen it a little bit? Would that help? How about now? But it's still not as sharp as it could be. You'd rather see it like this, right? I feel like I'm an optometrist here or something. <laughs> you know what that is, and you know what it stands for. But I'm guessing when you saw the first image, you're probably like, I'm not exactly sure what that stands for. I think this is what I'm, I'm trying to shoot for when I talk about how we are imperfect image bearers. People don't always see exactly who God is through us because we don't do it perfectly. Sin clouds it. How about this one? You know what that is? Some of you might be picking up on it's something having to do with today. Anybody got it yet? How about this? See, I, I figured that'd probably be the case. You kind of have a sense of it. I'm, I'm not quite getting it, but then it, when it fully comes into view, you're like, I should have known that, right? I think there's some innate desire in the heart of every person to know God, and we want a clear picture of who he is, but it's often clouded by our life and how we express it. So when people really want to see who God is, they may see something that is cloudy and murky. They might get the wrong impression of who God is because we don't bear his image properly, and it's cloudy. So instead of seeing who he is and the love he's shown, 
they get the wrong impression. I think some people even start off the conversation with, with God thinking that he's going to be judging them. And not just judging, but condemning them. God does judge perfectly, but instead of letting that judgment stand, he does something to mitigate the judgment. He sends his own son to die in our place, which totally changes the conversation, changes the tone of the conversation. And so when we look at this conversation that Jesus has with this woman at the well in John 4, we'll start with verse 1, it's important to see how Jesus perfectly bears the image of God to this woman and starts a relationship with her. Even someone who was an untouchable, was an outcast of outcasts, and we'll get to that in a second. When Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, though Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went again to Galilee. So the Pharisees have switched target from John the Baptist as public enemy number one now to Jesus. And Jesus kind of said it's time to get out of Dodge. He had to travel through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the property that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about noon. So a couple of important details here. Jesus doesn't do a normal Jewish thing. Samaritans are Jewish half-breeds who don't truly believe in Yahweh God. Their God is something of a mixture between Yahweh God and the Canaanite deities. So they're seen by Jewish people as half-breeds, outcasts. And if you're going through Samaria, you don't want to stay in that territory one iota longer, one second longer than you have to. You're going through there. It's, it's like driving through a ghetto where you can see anything bad happening, any kind of terrible crime. You don't want to be in that neighborhood any longer than you have to. And what does Jesus do? He stops there. He stops there at noon. And this is what, what's interesting about that detail. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Now, if you're not paying attention and you don't know the, the context of this, or the patterns that people generally had at that time, this detail might get lost on you. But it's significant. When do most people go to draw water? They go to draw water at the end of the day or at the beginning of the day, not in the middle of the day. And they don't go alone. Because as secure as most of us feel in our society now, that was not a time in the history of the world where people could feel safe going out to a place like the well on the outskirts of a city without reinforcements, without backup. And so the women of the town would go together. And we find this one alone and at a different time than all the others. Why? We'll find out. Jesus starts off the conversation, and this is important too. Jesus always starts the conversation and starts the community, and he does it with a simple request. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, because his disciples had gone into town to buy food. It's just the two of them. And she's a little bit surprised. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Not just a Jew who doesn't associate it with Samaritans, but a man talking to a woman, which was highly improper at that time. If a man were to speak to a woman outside the bonds of marriage, he would do it in the context of her husband being present. So she's surprised. Jews do not associate with Samaritans. There, there it is. John tells us. Jesus answered, If you knew the gift of God, and who is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would ask him, and he would give you living water. And she continues the conversation. Now, this is kind of a strange thing to say, isn't it? I'm going to give you living water. Oh, this guy's kind of strange. I've heard there's some strange people around here that could put me in danger. I'm going to leave now. But she leans in. Sir, said the woman, you don't even have a bucket, and the well is deep. So where do you get this living water? She's curious. She asks a good question. You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? <laughs> And it's a rhetorical question. She's thinking, no, but you and I have the blessing of history to look back and say, yes, he is greater than Jacob, their father. Our father Jacob, she's drawing on their common ancestry and saying, 
We have something in common, but you can't be better than that common ancestor. He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. Jesus said, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty. Again, simple, a simple statement of fact. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. Now, if you got an offer like that, what would stop you from saying, yes, please give me this now? Sounds like a great deal. Who knows? Sir, the woman said to him, give me the water so that I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. He offers right relationship with God. And she's thinking, well, maybe this is the way that I, I can avoid coming to this well again because that's kind of uncomfortable. Sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. Why is this uncomfortable to her? Well, we get to her personal circumstances. Go call your husband, he told her. Which I suppose in, in that day and age, this is like saying if we're going to continue this in-depth conversation, your husband should probably be present. But Jesus knows her, knows her story, knows her inside and out. Go call your husband, he told her, and come back here. I don't have a husband, she answered. And Jesus says, you have correctly said I don't have a husband, for you've had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. How does Jesus know this? Well, you and I know that he is omniscient. He's all-knowing. But this woman had to be just absolutely bowled over by the fact that he knew so much about her story. This man that she's never met, doesn't know from Adam, is stepping right into her life and saying, I know your story. Now, if you've ever had an encounter like that, I can't think of ever having one like that. If I could imagine what you'd probably do, you'd probably say, this is getting way too creepy. I got to get out of here. This is just way too weird that this person I've never met knows my story. And yet she doesn't. Sir, the woman replied, I see that you are a prophet. You have to be. You have to be to know my story like that. So this is getting a little uncomfortable. In social situations, what do people do when things that are uncomfortable are brought up? They either retreat, like I'm getting out of here, no more of this, or they deflect. And that's what we see the woman do here. I see that you're a prophet. Let's get out of my personal life because that's uncomfortable, and let's talk about you, Jesus. You seem to be a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. Our Samaritan ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. Now, you know as well as I do that to get a lively conversation started in, in, at a dinner table, all you got to do is put something controversial out there and stridently uh, profess the side of one and watch how things unfold. This is what she's doing. We Samaritans say this, you Jews say this, let's have a discussion. And Jesus, instead of directly attacking that idea, kind of takes a right-hand turn away from the entire thing. You're asking me to pick from one or the other, but I've got a better option. Believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain, where you Samaritans say we're supposed to, nor in Jerusalem, where we Jews say. You Samaritans worship what you do not know, statement of fact from a Jewish perspective, we worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. And this is also true. Jesus, a Jew, is standing there the salvation of the world. But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So instead of taking up the discussion of Samaria versus Jerusalem, the mountain versus the temple, Jesus says, what God wants from you is a relationship and worship that happens in your heart. 
people whose hearts are angled toward him, who want to hear his word, who want to follow him and live in right relationship. That's what the Father is after. And this gets to be a little bit overwhelming, like it probably is for many of us, because we don't often know what that truly means. I think many of us who have studied this for a lifetime are still just scratching the surface. And there's many more things to, to seek out and understand. So the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. This is something that I've heard. There's a whisper, there's a rumor, the one who can untangle this very massive web you've just put out there. The Messiah is coming, who's called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. You ever thought of, of, of a classroom where the, the professor, the teacher, is explaining something really complicated, and there's one person who sticks their hand up and says, I, I don't get it. You've got to explain that to me in a different way. Or someone else has to put it in different terms because this isn't making sense. This is what the woman has said. But she says something. She points to something that is so beautifully good. The Messiah is coming. He's going to clear it all up for us. And then Jesus says these faithful words. I, the one speaking to you, am he. He uses the Hebrew name of God. I am. I am he, the one talking to you. I'm the one who can unravel this for you. And just when this is happening, his disciples come back. And they were amazed that he was talking with a woman. Again, they know the impropriety of this. Yet no one said, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? The disciples had learned by this point that Jesus does strange things sometimes and we just kind of let him do his own thing. And you and I know that there was nothing improper going on here. In fact, Jesus digging into this conversation with this woman was exactly where he needed to be for her benefit, but also for ours. But not just for her benefit and ours now, but also for more people. Then the woman left her water jar. Why is that significant? Well, you don't go down to Walmart and get a new Tupperware jar to get more water. This is your water jar. To leave the water jar there means I'm coming back for it. There's something valuable enough there to hang on to. Leaves her water jar, went into town, the place where she is, the untouchable of untouchables, and told the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Okay, the woman who has had five husbands and five divorces and now is not living is man, living with the man who is not her husband this sounds like a great story it sounds like a soap opera please tell us tell us all the salacious details jesus she's putting herself out there because she's been seen for exactly who she is by someone who doesn't let her off the hook but loves her nonetheless and that is a powerful catalyst for community. She asked this question, could this be the Messiah? So not only do we get soap opera story from one of our current residents, who's way on the outskirts of society, but we get a slice of Messiah too. This is going to be good. And these people, we don't know who they, they were, but was that enough to encourage them to go and spend some time with Jesus? Apparently it was. Now there's a little interlude here when Jesus talk with, talks with his disciples, but we pick up on the other side of it about what happens when those people come into contact with Jesus. Now many Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of what the woman said when she testified, he told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days Many more believed because of what he said. So it started with her story, but they didn't believe until they started to interact with him. I wonder how many of them had interactions that were similar, where he said, well, you, uh, what about this that happened in your life? And are you really very proud of that? Oh, I guess you know my story too. To come into contact with someone who knows your story is a dangerous thing because they might judge you. And what's worse, they might be right. But to be fully known and fully loved is one of the greatest blessings that we can have in this life. And Jesus offers that, not just to this woman in such spectacular fashion, but to the whole town. And they believe. 
And they told the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said, since we have heard for ourselves and know that this really is the Savior of the world. We've come into contact with Jesus. He knows us. He knows our story, just like he knows hers. And he's gathered us together to wrestle with those facts. But I'm not perfect. He didn't let her off the hook. He's not leading, letting us off the hook. We're broken. We're sinful. We need saving. And he gives that to them. He gives them forgiveness. He gives them right relationship with God, which is what community is all about, right relationships. And in the midst of that, it sharpens all of their image of God. Remember what the little thing we did at the beginning here with the, the, the blurred images? What kind of image do you think that people in our culture have of God? Is he a vengeful judge that just wants to get us into hell and if we escape, it's something that we did or something we believed or something we said? Is he a merciful God who loves people, who doesn't count their sins against them, though they be many? How we express who Jesus is in the world, how we bear that image, says a lot about the God that we serve, and we're not always great image bearers. So what image do people get of God when they come into contact with us? It's a good question. Now over the, the past week or so, maybe a little bit longer, there's been this, this gathering of athletes from around the world. A real community, a global community gathered for a specific purpose, for competition. And there's a, a, a motto for the Olympics. Maybe you've heard this. It started in, in Latin. And those words have been around for a very long time. But recently, those three words had another word added to it. And if you're a traditionalist, I tend to be this way. If it's good, if it stood the test of time, why modify it? Why try to fix something that isn't broken? But I think this addition to the Olympic motto actually is a really good thing. It used to be, Citius altius fortius, faster, higher, stronger. And then they added this communiter together, in community. And I think it's a worthwhile addition. At a time when people can be so divided in our country, throughout the world, and territorial instead of more humane to one another, this is one time when not only do all the athletes of the world gather in one place, even in a controversial place, and the world generally sets aside all hostilities. Maybe you know this. It's generally seen as forbidden throughout the world for any military conflicts to happen during the Olympics to honor what happens in that state of fair play. And it's good. It's what community is supposed to look like. Yes, there are differences, and we're not going to sweep those under the rug. We all have blood on our hands. This is true. And yet, there is something that draws us together as community, as human beings made in the image of God, and as Christians, we have even more the blessings that God gives us through his son. How do we express that image? Well, I think sometimes people will get this as the picture of Jesus. They see him as someone who suffered terribly for people like you and me. And they don't want to have to wrestle with the fact that they may have had something to do with the demise of the son of God. But sometimes what they need to see is not a an unblurred image, but a widened image. Those of you who have been in my office have probably seen this picture on the wall. It's one of my favorites. It's not just that Jesus is an objective fact, but he needs to be pointed to like Luther is. He needs to be listened to like the congregation is. And Jesus is in the center. So that when people see us in the world, they see a picture of people who know this fact and point to it, but also receive it graciously. That's who Jesus is to us. He doesn't let us off the hook. He dies for the things that we have done that are wrong. And yet, he invites us to express his image to people by the way we are gracious to others, we're forgiving to others. And this is a good thing. So whether people see a vengeful judge as their first impression of, of Jesus, or not, that we start, we start where people are. 
And for a lot of people, I think they're so hurt and broken by the things that they've seen in the world that what they need is a picture more like this. An image of a good shepherd who goes after his sheep, especially the one that has strayed. Because I have been the one. You have been the one. And the good shepherd pursues us. Pursues us, even when we're not worth pursuing. Through anybody else's lens. This woman at Sychar, not worth pursuing by society standards. But Jesus pursues her heart. And what do we see? Community between Jesus and her springing up, and then a whole community of other people coming along because of the truth that she embraced. That she was broken and unwanted and unloved, but that she had found someone who was willing to love her in the midst of all of her brokenness. My friends, I think that's something that we all need to hear. We all need to embrace. That's the kind of community that, that we need to have here at Emmanuel, but also in our lives as image bearers. I'm not sure who's going to win the, the big game today. Do you? Any Bengals fans? Any Chargers fans? Chargers, Rams. See, I keep on getting that wrong. Thanks for correcting. Rams. No? Who's going to win? Will there be competitions in heaven? That's the question I really have. Will there be big games there? And will some win and some lose? I don't know. But will there be community around that competition, whether it's the Super Bowl or the Olympics or something else? I certainly hope so. And that's because we are in the image of God made for relationship with him and with one another, and he is the only one who can bring that around. Shall we pray? Father God, we thank and praise you for being a God who entrusts your image to us, broken people who often obscure it. And you call us into relationship around repentance and new life and living water, things that we can't possibly comprehend. And you love us in the midst of our, un our misunderstanding and our faults and all the things that make this world less than what it's supposed to be. We thank you for, for walking with us for showing us the way forward, for judging us properly and loving us nonetheless. May the community that you stir up around you, like you did for that woman so many years ago, be an image to the world that is worth pursuing. And pursue us, continue to pursue us until the day when all things are put right, when all community is just the way it was always intended to be. We ask it in Jesus' name. Now, all God's people said, Amen. And now may the peace of God, which goes far beyond what our heads can understand, keep your hearts, your minds always in Christ Jesus. Amen.